Okay, Kamani, Kamari, Leslie, got to get you caught up on Shiloh. Class is actually quite a bit ahead of you. We got all the way up to chapter 9 today. I'm going to read chapter 6 and 7 for you right here and now. So we know what's been going on. You know, he's hiding Shiloh up in the woods behind his house. Judd came looking for him. And uh, he's right at their house asking where Shiloh is. And meanwhile, Shiloh's just up the hill a little ways, right behind the house, keeping quiet. And Marty says, I haven't seen him. He's lying. He's lying like crazy. He's telling lies to Judd. He's telling lies to his mom and dad. even lies to his little sister. And now he's going to lie even more to more people as we meet more characters today. So here we go. Chapter 6. Night in West Virginia is as dark as black can be. No car lights sweeping around my walls or ceiling like when I stay overnight with David Howard down in Friendly. No street lamps shining in the windows. No lights from next door houses. Where I live, there ain't no street lamps at all. No house close enough to see from our windows. My eyes are open anyway. I stare up into the darkness of the living room and the darkness stares back. I'm remembering how once, several years ago, when Ma bought milk chocolate rabbits one Easter for me and Dara Lynn, I had finished eating mine. But Dara Lynn took only a nibble of hers every day or so, keeping it up on her dresser in its pink and yellow tinfoil, driving me nuts. And one day I just crept in there and ate off one of that rabbit's ears. Dara Lynn, of course, threw a fit, and when Ma asked me if I had done it, I said no. I could feel my cheeks and neck burning red. You sure, Marty? she asked. I'd only nodded and left the room. It was one of the worst days of my life. About an hour later, she came out on the porch while I was pushing myself slow in the swing and sat down beside me. You know, Marty, she said, Dara Lynn don't know who ate the ear off her candy rabbit, and I don't know who did it, but Jesus knows. And right this minute, Jesus is looking down with the saddest eyes on the, on the person who ate that chocolate. The Bible says that the worst thing that can ever possibly happen to us is to be separated forever from God's love. I hope you'll keep that in mind. I just swallowed it didn't say anything. But before I went to bed, when Ma asked me again about the rabbit, I gulped and said yes. And she made me get down on my knees and ask God's forgiveness, which wasn't so bad. I honestly felt better afterward. But then she said that Jesus wanted me to go to the next room and tell Daryl Lynn what I had done. And Daryl Lynn had a fit all over again. Threw a box of Crayolas at me and could have broke my nose. Called me a rotten, greedy pig. If that made Jesus sad, Ma never said. Now as I study the darkness in the room around me, I'm thinking about lies again. I hadn't lied to Judd Travers when I said I hadn't seen his dog in the yard today. But that was the honest-to-God truth. Because Shiloh hadn't been anywhere near our yard. But I also know that you can lie not only by what you say, but, but what you don't say. Nothing I told Judd was an outright lie. But what I had kept inside myself made him think that I hadn't seen his dog at all. Jesus, I whisper finally, what you want me to do? Be 100% honest and carry that dog back to Judd so that one of your creatures can be kicked and starved all over again? Or keep him here and fatten him up to glorify your creation? <clears throat> the question seemed to answer itself, and I'm pretty proud of that prayer. Repeat it to myself so as to remember it in case I need to use it again. If Jesus is anything like the story cards from Sunday school make him out to be, he ain't the kind and want a thin little beagle to be hurt. The problem's more mixed up than that, though. I'm lying to my folks as well. I'm not eating the leftover meatloaf I put away. Every bit of food saved is money saved that could go to buy Daryl Lynn a new pair of sneakers so Ma won't have to cut open the tops of her old ones to give her toes more room. Every little bit of food wasted is money wasted. If we ever have the least little bit of money to spare that doesn't have to go for the care of Grandma Preston, first thing we all want is a telephone so we don't have to ride down to Doc Murphy's to use his. But the way I figure, if it's food from my own plate, I would have eaten myself, but don't. What's the harm in that? Next morning when I get up to see Shiloh, I put the rope on his collar and lead him to the other side of the hill again, out of sight of all but God. Then I let him go, and we race and tumble and laugh and roll, stopping now and then just to lie in the clover, me on my back, Shiloh on his stomach, 
both of us panting and nuzzling each other. Don't know if Shiloh's getting more human or I'm getting to be more dog. If Jesus ever comes back to earth again, I'm thinking he'll come as a dog. Because there isn't anything as humble or patient or loving or loyal as the dog I have in my arms right now. Boy, he sure loves this dog, doesn't he? We eat our Sunday meal, but by late afternoon, storm clouds roll in, and the rain beats down on the tin roof of our house, streaming down the window glass, making a small pond in the side yard. I can't help staring out the window at the far hill. Will Shiloh, can he even, leap that fence to try and go somewhere it's more dry? Is he smart enough to go under that lean-to I'd made for him? Have I built it right away from the wind? What if he gets to howling? In 20 minutes, the rain stops, though. The sun comes out. The birds start to sing again. All those worms oozing up through the wet mud. Shallow stayed where he was, trusting me that where I put him was best. Being quiet, like he knows his life depends on it. Marty, Dad says, going outside with a rag to wipe off his Jeep. I saw Mrs. Howard yesterday, and she said David was back from Tennessee, wanting to know when you boys could get together. She said David would like to come up here someday next week. I like David Howard fine, but I sure don't want him up here. David likes the hill, always wants to play up there. He's not afraid of snakes the way Darren Lynn is. David, in fact, likes to go to the very top of that hill and then go running lickety-split down it, racing to see who's first to the fence at the bottom. Likes to climb the trees up there, too, and play lookout. Well, I'll go down to David's tomorrow, I say. I'd rather do that. Why not do both, Ma says. Coming out to throw some wa some mash to the hens. You've hardly seen any friends all summer, Marty. Why don't you go down to Friendly one afternoon and ask David to come up here in another? There's nothing much to do up here, I say, not knowing how else to answer. It was the wrong answer. Both Ma and Dad were looking at me now. You said just the other day you had plenty to do here, Dad tells me, wringing out his rag at the pump. Lots for me to do, but not much for David Howard, I say. A lie. There's another lie. That's a flat-out lie. Funny how one lie leads to another, and before you know it, your whole life is a lie. Give me a lie. A very important theme, right? Lies lead to more lies. Next thing you know, you're just lying to cover each lie. More and more lies. Remember that next time you want to lie to try and solve a problem. It might just cause bigger problems for you. You might think you're doing something right. But all that's getting from Marty here is more and more trouble. I sit on the porch swing later, not even bothering to push it, and listen to the table being set inside. What do you figure is wrong with that boy, Lou? Dad's voice. Just being 11, I guess, Ma tells him. 11's a moody age. Was for me, anyways. You think that's all it is? What pleases you one day don't please you at all the next. What more do you do you think it is? Don't think he's got that dog on his mind still, do you? Eleven's got about everything on its mind, Ma answers. And then the evening news comes on, and Daryl Lynn and Becky come out to the porch, leaving the TV to Daddy. Daryl Lynn's got the devil in her tonight. A little bit bored with summer, but not quite ready for school to start. Just for devilment, she plunks herself down beside me in that swing and starts doing everything I do. I sigh, she sighs. I rest my arms on my head. She does the same. Gets Becky doing it too, both of them laughing to beat the band. When I have my fill of this nonsense, I decide to go up the hill and see how Shyla's is doing. But as I go down off the porch, Darlene gets up and makes as if to follow me. I stop. I'm looking to find me a snake stick, I say as if to myself. I'm looking to find me a snake stick, Darlin says. I don't pay her no mind at all. Just start walking along the edge of the yard, picking up a stick there, a stick there. Darlin tagging along behind. It's got to have the longest handle and a good strong fork on the end, I say, because that was the biggest, meanest snake I ever saw in my life. Darlin stops dead still. She couldn't say all that if she tried, but she's not interested anymore in trying. What snake, she says. Snake I saw up the, on the hill this morning, I tell her. Must have been four or five feet long, just looking for somebody's leg to wrap itself around. Darlene don't go a step further. Becky don't even come down off the porch. 
What are you going to do when you find it? Daryl asks. Try to keep it from biting me first. Pick it up with my stick second and put it in a sack and carry it clear on up past the Shiloh schoolhouse. Let it out in the woods there. Won't kill it unless I have to. Kill it, says Daryl Lynn. Get your gun and blow its head off. You've been watching too much stuff on TV, Daryl Lynn, I tell her. Even Snake's got the right to live. I'm thinking how if I ever become a vet's helper, I got to take care of pet snakes too. Next day, to head off David Howard from riding up from Friendly on his bike, I go down to see him. I attended to Shiloh first, taking a fistful of scrambled eggs left over from breakfast, a bit of bacon, and a half slice of whole wheat toast that I stuck in my jeans pocket. It's not enough for the dog, I know, but probably more than you'd get from Judd. It's not enough for me either. Sneaking off half my breakfast, lunch, and dinner for Shiloh like I'm doing means me going half hungry all the time. But if I eat extra, then it means Shiloh's costing us money we can't afford. I fill my pockets with wormy peaches before I set out for Friendly, biting off each piece and spitting it out in my hand, picking out the worms before I put it back in my mouth. It pleased me that Shiloh was sleeping in his lean-to when I'd gone up that morning. The ground was dry under there, and I had brought up some old gunny sacks from the shed for him to lie on, made it seem more like a bed to him, more like a home. The walk to Friendly takes a good long time unless you hitch a ride. I'm not allowed to get in a car with somebody I don't know, but Dad being the mail carrier for this part of the country, I know most everybody who goes by. The first person to come along with this day, though, is Judd Travers. When I hear the sound of a motor and turn to see his truck slowing down, I turn forward again and keep on walking, but he pulls up beside me. Want to lift these things out? No thanks, I say. Almost there. Where are you going? I couldn't think fast enough to lie. David Howards? Well, heck, boy, you ain't even halfway hop in. I know I don't have to unless I want it, but if he's already suspicious about me, that'll only make it worse, so I get in. Seen my dog yet? First thing out of his mouth. I've been looking over all the roads, I tell him in answer. No beagle. Liar. Well, I don't think he'd stick to roads, Judd says. Not a dog as shy as him. Shy as a field mouse, except when he's around rabbits. That's what the man said who sold him to me, and he was sure right about that. How much did you pay for him? I ask. Got him cheap because he's shy. $35. Worth a lot more than that as a hunting dog if I could just keep that darn animal home. You gotta treat a dog good if you want him to stick around, I say, bold as brass. What do you know about it? Judd jerks his head in my direction, then turns the other way, spits his tobacco out the window. You never had it you never even had a dog, had did you? I figured a dog's the same as a kid. You don't treat a kid right, he'll run off first chance he gets too. Okay, everybody listen to this part very closely. Kamari, Kamani, Leslie. We're going to learn some things about Judd. All right? See maybe why he's the way he is. So let's go back to what Marty says. I figure that a dog's the same as a kid. You don't treat a kid right, he'll run off first chance he gets, too. Judd laughs. Well, if that was true, I would have run away when I was four. Far back as I can remember, Pa took the belt to me. Big old welts on my back, so raw I could hardly pull my shirt on. I stuck around. Didn't have any place else to go. I turned out, didn't I? Turned out how? The boldness in my chest is growing, taking up all the air. Now Judd sounds mad. You trying to be smart with me, boy? No, just asking how you turned out. Somebody who was beat since he was four. I feel sorry is what I feel. Judd's real quiet a moment. The big old wad of tobacco in his cheek bobs up and down. Well, don't go wasting your sorry on me, he says. Nobody ever felt sorry for me, and I never felt sorry for nobody else. Sorry is something I can do without. I don't say anything at all. We reach the road where David Howard lives, and the truck slows down. I can walk from here, I tell him. Thanks, I get out. But as I come around the truck to cross the street, Judd leans out the window. Like I said, that dog's a shy one. Don't think you'll see much of him near the road, but you keep your eyes out for him in the fields. That's where he'll be, more than likely. You see him, all you gotta do is whistle. That's what I teach him. I whistle, and he comes to me, and he gets fed. 
but he does something I don't like. I kick him clear to China. You see him? Just whistle and hang on to him, and I'll come pick him up. You hear? I hear, I tell him, and keep walking. So, Judd, sounds like he had it rough growing up, beaten by his dad. Not just like a spanking, you know, he was beaten. So that his body had welts all over it and everything. So, sounds like Judd hasn't had a very happy life. Might help us understand why he's the way he is. So, all right, before I start chapter 7, chapter 7 is not very long, so I'm going to go ahead and read it. Um, go ahead and take a quick break, and then let's come on back and turn the video on. Okay, if you're back, you're ready for chapter 7. We're going to meet a new character, Marty's friend David Howard. David Howard's house is about twice as big as ours for about half as many people. Only him and his mom and dad. Mr. Howard works for the Tyler Star News in Sistersville, and David's mom is a teacher. They're always glad to have me come down to visit, partly because David and I are best friends, and partly, I think, because their old house is so big, the three of them get lost in it. It's got two floors, three counting the basement and four counting the attic. It has four bedrooms upstairs, one for David and one for his folks. One just for company and one for his father's books with a computer in it. Downstairs is a big kitchen, a dining room with a fancy light hanging over the table, a parlor and side room with lots of windows just for plants, plus a porch that runs along three sides of the house. I, I told Ma once the Howards had a room just for company, a room just for books, and a room just for plants, and she said that was three rooms too many. First time I ever saw any envy in my Ma. David says the house used to belong to his great-granddaddy, so I figure it'll get to be David's someday. Like maybe our little house and the, on, and the hill and meadow and the far woods will belong to me and Shiloh, except I'd probably have to share it with Daryl Lynn and Becky and whoever they marry. And that's a whole lot of people for four rooms. Marty, Mrs. Howard says when I ring their doorbell. That sounds like church chimes. We're so glad to see you. Come on in. She always means it, too. It's as though she thinks about me even when I'm not there. Then David comes whooping downstairs, carrying the helicopter that flies when you pull a string. And pretty soon we're out in the backyard, chasing around after the helicopter and telling each other what we've been doing the six weeks since school let out. I got to bite my tongue not to let on about Shiloh. We sit on David's back steps and eat popsicles his mom makes out of pineapple juice. I tell David about the fox I saw with a gray body and a red head, and he tells about how his aunt's Siamese cat that yowls just for the pure joy of making noise. Then I tell him about Judd Travers and how mean he is to his dogs, not mentioning Shiloh, of course, and then David says he's got the surprise to show me. We go upstairs to his room, and David says he's got a pet and asks, do I want to hold it? Sure, I tell him. What is it? Sit down and close your eyes and hold out your hands, says David. I sit down on the edge of his bed and close my eyes and hold out my hands. I expect something warm and wiggly and furry to plop into my arms. Instead, I feel something cold and round and plastic. And when I look, it's a fishbowl with sand in it and a hermit crab scurrying around with a shell on its back. This is a pet? My first pet, David says. His name is Hermie. See all those shells in there? We bought them for him. At night, he gets out of one and puts on another, just like changing clothes. I look at David, and I look at the crab in a fishbowl, and I want to tell him about Shiloh and how we run up and down the far side of the hill every day and roll in the grass, and how he licks my face. But I can't tell him anything. Not yet. Not ever, maybe. Hermie's sort of fun, though. We get out David's old blocks, the kind you play with back in kindergarten, and we build, we build this big maze with walls on both sides, and then we put Hermie in it. He skids along the maze, looking which way to go, and we laugh when he gets himself in a dead end. I guess any kind of pet's okay once you get used to it, but I wouldn't trade Shiloh for all the hermit crabs in the world. When can I come up to your house, David asks me, when we put the blocks away. I don't know, I tell him. Ma's had this sort of headache lately, and she can't take any noise at all. Boy, I'm sure asking for trouble with that one. Guys, he keeps telling lies, guys. More and more lies. 
We could stay out on that big hill, David suggests. Chase around in that field. Play lookout. Don't think we ought to till she's feeling better, I say. I'll let you know, but I can come down here again next week, maybe. I tell Mrs. Howard I got to be home by late afternoon to help out, and she says surely I can stay for lunch, which is what I was hoping. I sit down at the table with placemats, which are little doll-sized tablecloths, one under each plate. Mrs. Howard's made us each a chicken salad sandwich with lettuce and tomato, and toothpicks with olives on top to hold it all together. David's ma is like that. I think it's because she's a teacher, always looking for ways to make something better than it is. She does the same with boys. She don't just leave us to eat by ourselves. My mom picks us a lunch, packs us a lunch, and lets us eat out in the woods. Mrs. Howard always sits down to eat with us and talks about grown-up things. Today she tells us about how we've got to, we've got some new people elected to office who are going to be more honest. She hopes then, sorry. Today she tells us about how we've got some new people elected to office who are going to be more honest, she hopes, than the people they defeated, and how the country is going to be better because of it, and so will the whole state of West Virginia. David's mouth thinks big. You can't just go on electing people to government because they were friends of your father or grandfather, she says, chewing on a bite of celery. Mostly I'm thinking about the food. I eat every bit of my chicken sandwich. I'm so hungry I don't even save some for Shiloh, and then I'm ashamed of myself. Mrs. Howard notices the way I pick up every little crumb, and she says, I've got enough chicken salad left for another half of a sandwich, Marty. Would you like it? Sure, it tastes good on the walk back home, I tell her, and she sets right to work wrapping it up for me. Shiloh's dinner, I tell myself. So he's lying again, now to David's mom. But lunch isn't over yet. After the sandwich... There's tapioca pudding and chocolate-covered graham crackers, which I love almost as much as Christmas. I don't see any way to get the pudding to Shiloh, so I eat that. But I ask, can I take a couple cookies along to eat on the way home, too? And she opens a sack and sticks in six cookies. Ma would have blushed with shame if she heard me ask this, but seems I'm at the point where I'll do most anything for Shiloh. A lie don't seem like a lie anymore when it's meant to save a dog, and right and wrong is all mixed up in my head. Sure is all mixed up in his head. What's the right thing to do? Have you ever noticed if you start telling lies, it gets easier and easier just to tell more lies? He's going to have to be careful here, all these lies he's telling. Worse than that, when I leave David's house, I don't even head home. First, I go down the street to the corner store and ask Mr. Wallace, does he have any sort of old cheese or lunch meat he can sell me cheap? I got 53 cents for the cans I collected so far that Dad turned in for me, and I show Mr. Wallace how much I got. Well, Marty, let me see what I can find back here, he says, leading me into the little room behind the counter. He's sort of talking without looking at me, the way folks do when they don't want to embarrass you. I got some stuff here that's not exactly spoiled, but it's too old to sell. Wouldn't want your family getting sick on it, though. I blush then. Because my dad would die of embarrassment if he knew what Mr. Wallace is thinking. That I'm buying this food for our supper. But there's no way in the world I can let on about Shiloh. I give him all the change I got and he lets me have a big hunk of cheese. Moldy on one side. A carton of sour cream and a half package of Frankfurters that somebody opened and bought five of. I'm happy as a flea on a dog. Somehow I know without asking that Mr. Wallace isn't going to go telling folks about it because people around here tend to keep quiet about someone else's business. Next problem I got to solve, though, is how to keep all this stuff from spoiling in the July heat. Can't keep it in our refrigerator or Ma would notice right off. When I get home, Ma's ironing and watching TV, and Darlin and Becky's out on the front swing with paper dolls spread out all over the place. So I fish around out in the shed till I find me an old high C can. I sneak off up the hill with the can and all the food I got with me. Then with Shiloh watching, I put a rock in the bottom of the can to hold it down and set it in the cool stream, surround it with rocks, and put the container of sour cream, the frankfurters, and the cheese and cookies in there. Put the plastic lid on and set a large rock on top to keep the raccoons out. I'm so proud of myself, I like to crow. Hungry again, too, but that half chicken salad sandwich from Mrs. Howard is for Shiloh's dinner, 
and I give it to him right off. After that, Shiloh and me go on a good long run over the meadow on the far side of the hill. And after I take him back, I put fresh water in the pie pan and love him good. I start down the hill halfway to the bottom. And here comes Daryl Lynn. Oh, boy. What you doing up here? I ask her, heart starting to thump. Just wanted to see what you're doing, she complains. You go off up here every day almost. You leave Becky by herself while Ma's ironing? Becky's okay. She turns and follows me back down the hill. Shiloh up in the pen. Don't make a sound. That's how smart a dog he is. Well, I was looking for that snake again, but he's hiding from me good, I tell her. You still didn't get him, she asks. And when I look back, she's got her eyes to the left, then to the right. You didn't even take your snake stick, she says. She's a smart one, too. Got me a stick back up on the hill, I tell her. How many snakes you figure are up there, Marty? Oh, about 29 that you can see. Baby snakes all over the place, though, hiding. Growing into big ones all the time. Dara Lynn's walking faster now, hurrying to get on by me. Watching every place she sets her foot. I don't feel good about the lies I tell Dara Lynn or David or his ma. But don't feel exactly bad, neither. If what Grandma Preston told me once about heaven and hell is true and liars go to hell, then I guess that's where I'm heading. But she also told me that only people are allowed in heaven, not animals. And if, that has, and if I was to go to heaven and look down and see Shiloh left below, head on his paws, I'd run away from heaven, sure. Goodness. At some point you have to say, geez, Marty, it's just a dog. Lighten up. So anyway, that's chapter six and seven. He's spreading more lies. You know, he's down at the store getting food and, you know, for Shiloh. But what do you think the store owner thinks? Mr. Wallace, oh boy, his family needs more food. So that could cause trouble. And then also he tells David and his mom, oh, David shouldn't come up. Mom's been having a headache lately. Uh, that's not a good idea either. All right. These lies can come back and bite you. So could become a trouble spot for him. We'll see. So, all right.